All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with the, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. Michael Hyatt. Michael, how you doing? I'm doing great, James. Good to be on with you. It is fantastic to have you here. So first and foremost, thank you for making the time. And I think that's uh, going to be pretty much the, the, uh, the core topic that we're going to be talking about is making the time, having the time. But I do really appreciate it, especially after reading your book about making the time and mm. be on this show. Uh, and I actually may want to dive into that a little bit later about what, what was your thinking process behind your productivity system that had you say yes. Uh, but I do acknowledge you for that and appreciate that. I know you're, you're a busy man doing a lot of things. Um, and I have in my hand right in front of me, your latest book, Free to Focus, a total productivity system to achieving more by doing less. And that's really been such a, a, a through line message for me on this show is, is about the power of, of doing less. And so this, this message just resonates, so I, I had to get you on. I'm wondering if you could start first and foremost and kind of give us a quick uh, synopsis of, of what this book is, is really about. Yeah, well, the book is really, uh, let me just tell you a story to start with. So back in the year 2000, I was working for a large book publishing company. And it was Thomas Nelson Publishers, and they gave me responsibility. I became the general manager for one of the company's 14 book publishing divisions. It was my dream job. i had always wanted the job of being a publisher. And what I discovered after I got the job, after I got into the job, was that of out of the 14 divisions, this particular division was number 14 out of 14. It had zero sales growth. It was losing money and the staff morale was terrible. So the CEO said to me, he said, how long is it going to take you to turn this around? I said, and I just pulled a number out of the air. I said, probably three years. And he said, okay, you got it. So I went back with the team, we created a vision, we got really busy, worked hard, and in 18 months, miraculously, we were able to turn it around so that we went literally from number 14 to number one. Most profitable, best sales growth, super morale. But it came at some cost to myself. So I got a, a big promotion, I got a big fat bonus, and I went home to tell my wife, Gail, and I said, babe, you'll never believe what happened. I told her I was so excited. But I could tell she was a little less than enthusiastic. You know, she tried to be positive and encouraging, but I could tell there was just something, there was a hitch in her giddy up. So she said, let's go into the den and talk. And so we sat down and I'm thinking to myself, uh-oh. She looked at me and I could just kind of tell her eyes were getting moist and, and she said to me, she said, you know, here's my issue. She said, you're never home. And she said, you've got five daughters who desperately need you. And I, and I wanted to be defensive, but I knew she was right. And she said, even when you are home, you're not here. And she said, and then at this point, she started crying. She said, I feel like I'm a single mom. Wow. And I mean, it was, it just slayed me. You know, I just thought, gosh, you know, here I am succeeding at work and losing at home. And I felt like I had this impossible choice. It was either Gail or it was the business. And the truth is I was working nights, weekends. I wasn't working out. I wasn't eating well. I was overweight. I, I just wasn't taking care of myself. And I knew something had to change. And I really don't think anybody should have to choose between winning at work and succeeding at life. And I think the key is that you've got to have a productivity system. You've got to have a way of winning at work that doesn't cost you the most important things in your life because none of us are going to get to the end of our life and look back and say, oh, if I'd only spent more time at work. So that sent me on a 20-year quest to try to find a way to achieve more by doing less. And what I've learned now in my own life and now with uh, hundreds of my clients and thousands of our customers is actually how to deliver on that promise. So last year, just for example, um, my business grew 62%. It's the third year in a row that we've been on the Inc. 5000 list of the fastest growing private companies in America but I took off 162 days. Wow. So that was every weekend, including 11 weeks of vacation. So it is possible. Yeah. It, it must be hard too, because especially to have that experience of going from you know, dead last to the most profitable division, there is a reward for all that hard work. Definitely. There was financial reward. There was a reward in status, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I definitely got a sense of that, especially in the book, how, how common it is for all of us to keep chasing that. Um, but you really brought up something that I just think is so profound, which is really just this idea that like 
doing more, working more really just creates more work. Especially if you're like working for somebody else and it's like, you're so, you get so much done. It's like, well, here, I'm just going to give you more work to do. That. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. You know, you just get, get more work. And that certainly was happening to me uh, in that corporate job. And it's happened to me as an entrepreneur too. I know you're, you've experienced this success, success begets success. And if you don't get something in place, some kind of boundaries, something in place, it just eats up all your life. And, and the truth is I've been married for 41 years. I've got five adult children. I've got nine grandchildren. I love them all to pieces. I want great relationships with them. And I want to be in the best health I can be in, you know, because all this stuff is symbiotic. And if you don't figure it out what works in all of your life, it's going to end up working in none of your life. Because if you feel stress at work, that's going to impact your health. If your, your health can impact your marriage, your relationship with your kids, all of it works together or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Well, and you, you share so many great um, specific stats and studies and, and data that, that points to um, the fallacy that the, the, more, the more you work, the longer you work, that it actually doesn't allow you to achieve more. Um, but I want to call to something that actually really made me smile because I, I know of the quote, which is the reference to Elon Musk. Um, yeah. And I'd have to find it specific, specifically, but he said, but it was something to the effect of like, you know, if, if, if you can work a hundred hour a week, you're going to achieve, you know, in the third of somebody who's going to work 40 hours a week. And, and you're really calling uh, BS to that. I am. Yeah. yeah, because what that assumes is that you're a freaking robot. Mm -hmm. You know, that the same, you bring the same energy to hour 60 of your work week that you bring to hour one of your work week. And that's, that's not the truth. I mean, all the research would show you that once you get past about 50 to 55 hours of work, you actually start going backwards in terms of productivity. There's no additional productivity gain for every hour work. And yes, you can occasionally do it in short sprints, but you can't sustain it. And all you have to look, and I don't want to pick on Elon Musk because he's an amazing person. I don't know him personally and it wouldn't be fair, but, but I will say this. I don't really think it's working out that well for him. Mm. You know, and so, um, yeah, I think, I think that unfortunately there's a lot of young entrepreneurs who are taking his advice. They fall into what I call the hustle fallacy and where they're just like burning the midnight oil, doing everything to win at work. And they end up blowing up their marriages or their most important relationships blowing up their health, having some kind of crisis. And at, the, and at the end of the day, they regret that they gave out all that time to work. But then I also see people, maybe you see some of these too, that apply what I call the ambition break, where they just say, whoa, I do not want my work to consume my life. So I'm going to throttle back my ambition, throttle back my expectations, settle for less than my potential, and give myself to my most important relationships. And I'd, I'd like to think that if I had to choose between the two, I'd choose that one. But I don't think, I think it's a false dichotomy. Yeah. How do you, how do you navigate those two um, polar opposites, especially in, in the message that you're sharing both on your podcast and your book? Because I well, think it's really easy for somebody to read this and be like, well, I knew I shouldn't be working. You know, I'm just going to sit on the couch and watch more Netflix then. Yeah. Well, you know, kind of our, our tagline for our company is um, win at work and succeed at life. We're after something we call the double win. And it begins, and this is chapter one of the book, where we begin with a productivity vision. What is the purpose of productivity? Why do we want to be more productive? Is it just so that we have more hours to do even more stuff so that we can jam more tasks into our already overflowing task list? Or instead, is it about something else? And what I would contend and what I argue in the first chapter is that it really ought to be about freedom. You know, if we're truly, the more productive we are, the more free we ought to be. And I talk about four specific kinds of freedom. So the freedom, first of all, to focus. You know, we live in a, in a world that is so distracted where people do a lot of shallow work and it's, it's a superpower if you can really focus and really do that deep work that, that moves the needle forward in your business and in your life. So the freedom to focus is key. The freedom to be present. You know, so often when I was back in the corporate world and, and shackled with all this stuff, you know, when I was at home, I was thinking about work. And when I was at work, I was thinking about home. I wasn't present anywhere. And so I want to be fully present where I am so that I can, can be at work, fully engaged, confident that I'm given adequate time at home and things are taken care of there. And conversely, when I'm out to dinner with my wife or I'm with one of, my, one of my daughters, that I can be fully present with them and not thinking about my work. 
And then I want the freedom. This is the third one, the freedom to be spontaneous so that my life is not so over-programmed that I can't stop what I'm doing, you know, to, to have coffee with a friend. And then finally, the freedom to do nothing at all. So the Italians have a phrase, la dolce far niente, which means the sweetness of doing nothing. And I love this. We don't do enough of this in our culture. We wear business as a badge of honor, but I love in Italy. Have you been there? Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, you know how it is, like five o'clock at night, five to six o'clock at night, everybody pours out into the big spaces and has cocktails and just enjoys being with one another. And I love that. I mean, that's where we, we go to Italy to have those type of intentional <laughs> experience. It's really, right. It's, yeah. Uh, I don't go there to work because their internet is just awful. So you might as well just enjoy. <laughs> the, exactly. The, <laughs> um, well, uh, I love this and I want to dive a little deeper into some of these things, but one of the things that I, this great distinction that, that you really um, brought out in the book is um, combining uh, this sweet spot of these two areas of passion and proficiency and how that works together to create this desire zone. Can you, can you start speaking a little bit about, about that? Cause that's what I really found was like, that's what's going to give us a lot of that freedom that we're all seeking for. Yeah, it really is. And, and this is in chapter two evaluate, but it's something I call the freedom compass, but it becomes kind of a filter by which we can evaluate requests and opportunities to make sure that they're in alignment with the best and highest use of us. Because I think if we're honest, if we look at our task list and all the requests that come in and the opportunities, you know, there's so much that doesn't really fit who we are. Uh, it's, it's not the best and highest use of us. So how do we have a filter? And one of my complaints, by the way, you know, there's a lot of popularity around David Allen's system, getting things done. And I'm a friend of David's, I'm a fan of David's, and I love that system and have used it for years, but it's missing one essential piece and that's a filter. So in that system, if it pops into your head, it goes on that master to-do list, which is why it feels like that to-do list never gets smaller. It's just keep, keep adding stuff to it. So here's what I do. In the, in the Freedom Compass, if you think of a two-by-two two matrix, you know, four quadrants, and one axis is passion, that is what you're good at, what you love, what you enjoy, what gets you up in the bed, out of bed in the morning, what lights you up. And the other axis is proficiency, what you're good at, where you're skilled, and what drives the results in your business. So when you're passionate and when you're proficient, that creates a quadrant that I call the desire zone. And so the desire zone is where you want to be spending the bulk of your time. That's the best and highest use of you. It's the thing that's going to give you the most job satisfaction because you enjoy it. It's going to drive the business results forward because you're proficient at it. The exact opposite of that is where you have no passion, no proficiency, and this is what I call the drudgery zone. And it's going to be different for everybody. Thank God it's different for everybody. Uh, but for me, it would look like this. Things that I'm not passionate and not proficient at would be processing email, managing my own calendar, uh, booking travel, basically anything administrative. Thankfully, my administrative assistant, my executive assistant, Jim, loves that stuff. You know, that's in his desire zone. So we complement one another beautifully. There's another zone that we got to really be careful of. And a lot of entrepreneurs fall into this one. I call it the disinterest zone. And this is where you have little or no passion, but a lot of proficiency. You're good at it. It just bores you. And for me, for an example, when I left the big world of the corporate world, I got pretty good at financially, financial related stuff because as a CEO, that's a lot of what you have to supervise. And so I could do all my accounting. I was good at QuickBooks when I started my business, but it bored me to death. That was my disinterest zone work. Again, it's not the highest and best use of me. Probably one of the most dangerous though, zones though is the distraction zone where you have passion, but no proficiency or a little proficiency. So give you an example. I'm sure you could relate to this one. I don't know if this, you've done this, but um, in the early days of my business, I love to do kind of the web development and the web design. Oh, yeah. So I love that because finding a new, you know, WordPress plugin or switching out a theme on my site was a lot more fun than actually creating content. And so it became a distraction to me. It was a place that I went to escape. And a lot of this stuff that populates our to-do list ends up being that kind of fake work stuff that keeps us from doing the desire zone stuff that's really going to drive the business results. 
So I would say for entrepreneurs, and it's, and it's a journey, so this can't happen overnight, James, but as a journey, you want to get to the place where 90 to 95% of the things you do on a daily basis are desire zone activities. And for me, like there's only three things that fit into my desire zone and everything else gets, you know, eliminated, automated, or delegated out to my team. Uh, I love that. And speaking of uh, journey, let me, let me ask, when, when did you start your, your, your blog? How long 2004, ago? believe it or not. 2004. So, so a couple of questions there just kind of overlaying uh, this quadrant because I just think it's uh, ele- so elegant. Um, do you feel like since 2004 that your desire zone and your passion and what you've been proficient at is a moving target? Do you feel like it's changed over the years? Yeah, it, it has. And, and that's because right in the middle of that diagram, and I can't remember if we represented it in the book this way uh, or not, but right in the middle of that diagram, we now put something called, yeah, actually we have this on page 55, the development zone. And that's where you can park stuff that you're not quite sure about yet. You know, it's still kind of an open question. So for example, like you're a big video guy. When I started doing video, doing direct to camera stuff, I hated it. I would rather be shot, you know, publicly hung than have to do video. Really? And so I, Oh my gosh, I would, I would sit in front of video. I remember asking Gail one time, I said, honey, I just need you for a few minutes to run the camera for me. I just got to shoot a, like a little short two minute thing. So like at about take 50, <laughs> she, she says to me, she says, I don't have all day to do this. You know, this is the last take, get it right. And I just, oh, I dreaded it. Now I love it. I love doing live video, live streaming stuff, especially. Public speaking, the same thing. I hated it at the beginning. That would have been in my development zone. But, uh, but now it's definitely, you know, up there in my desire zone. Well, and that's funny that you share that story because we have obviously a very close mutual friend, Stu McLaren. Yeah. And I am just sharing a story about you one time where he came to you saying, okay, I need, Michael, I need a video. I need it to hit these points. Um, and you just kind of like got quiet for a second. You go, okay, cool. Roll the camera. And he said, you did it one take perfectly, not a problem. So well, clearly at one point it, it, you got to that level of proficiency. Yeah. You know, and that's, I don't know if I put in 10,000 hours, but I, I, I do think you get better at it, you know, over time. And so, and, and, I'm, and frankly, I'm glad I didn't bail at it because it's been such an important part of my business. But I think sometimes you have to park thing in the develop, stuff in the development zone to have got a little bit more experience, a little bit more practice, and then you can evaluate. What you can't do is deceive yourself into thinking, you know, hey, I'm not quite sure what the ROI is on this social media, but I sure enjoy doing it. You know, and you spend an inordinate amount of time doing it, it doesn't really generate any results. Well, and I think that's where uh, our, our listeners may get a little like stuck is like, okay, here's these quadrants and the, the distinctions are very clear. But when you're doing something for the first time, how do you know if this is something that right now it's new for you so you don't have the proficiency but you will develop that and it will have an ROI um, versus something that you just never, never should touch or be doing yourself. Like yeah. I, I've learned that for myself, but I think that's really hard for. for it is. It's, and it's, and it's certainly art, not science. And I think sometimes you just have to be willing to kind of live in the tension of, I'm not quite sure yet, but I, I, I would say this, if in your gut you sense this, this is going to be important for your business, then you might just have to knuckle down and learn it. And so for me, public speaking was like that. I knew that, gosh, public speaking is going to really drive my business and whether I'm speaking in front of a camera or in front of a live audience. So I just got to figure this out. And so I just sensed that it was going to be important and I stood, stayed with it long enough to where I got good at it and then actually loved it, loved it. And you probably saw progress of your improvement along the way. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Anything we've never done before, we're not going to be perfect at it. But- but the web development thing, that's another thing. Okay, so like I got to tell you a funny story about that. So finally, I realized, hey, this is a d- distraction zone activity. I need to hire a web developer. I mean, the math said, you know, I could hire a WordPress developer for $50 an hour. And, you know, I don't know what I was billing out, but, you know, $100, $150, $200 an hour. And it doesn't make sense to pay a mediocre po- programmer, myself, $150, $200 an hour, you know, to be doing WordPress development. So when I hired my WordPress developer, he said, um, he said, yeah, I'm willing to come to work for you. He said on one condition. And I said, what's that? He said, you never, ever touch the back end of WordPress again. <laughs> <laughs> and that was so good. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious. And you don't have to give 
me the specific number, but do you have a number in your head of uh, an hourly rate for yourself today? Yeah. And do you, do you use that as well as like, well, if I could hire somebody? Totally. I, the, the reason I'm hesitant because it, it's kind of a moving target because my business has been growing so fast, but yeah, I mean, now it's thousands of dollars an hour. And we, we use that actually more as an internal tool for what's worth my time. And just for all of us to kind of take a deep breath and say, is it really worth my time? Cause I, you know, I have 168 hours a week like everybody else. We, we've got a tool that we use um, in our business and with our coaching clients called spend your days on paper. And the idea is basically uh, it's, it's like a budget, but for your time. And so going through the upcoming year. So like we're just beginning this process right now for 2020 and saying, look, here's how many days I want off. I always start with that, by the way. How many days do I want to take off? So last year I took off 162. This year I'll take off 162. But I put those, you know, in that tool first. So I account for the days I went off. And then I got to get everything else done in the time that's left. And so it's a great place to start. I love but it also keeps me from over, over programming myself. Do you, um, have you compromised on any of those days off? As, as it, when push comes to shove, you've had to say no to it. One or yeah, two I rarely, but yes, I have. So here's my rules for the, for that time off. I don't want to think about work. Yeah. I don't want to talk about work. I don't want to read about work or listen to podcasts about work. And I don't want to do any work. So I had um, a situation this summer on my sabbatical. Gail and I take a month off solid four weeks uh, in the middle of the summer. We've done that every year for eight years. And uh, so two of the days this last year, I had about maybe 15 to 30 minutes of work-related stuff I had to deal with. My, my daughter happened to be out on maternity leave and she runs our business. So there was just no place to go with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I'm curious, cause this is a big thing that comes up for a lot of my listeners and students. And it's something that I used to deal with a lot is when you take that time off, um, a lot of entrepreneurs especially feel a sense of either uncertainty or a lot of guilt. Is that something that you have experienced? And if so, like, what are your thoughts and advice for somebody that's going through that? Yeah, that's a great question. I definitely have experienced that. So there's a huge gravitational pull to work. And even when we're trying to relax, when we're taking time off, you know, there's always that pull back to work. Why? Because there's always more stuff you can do. I mean, even if you've got it all done, there's new opportunities, new projects to, you know, flesh out or to dream about or whatever. The thing that I've found, the only thing that I've found that works for me is to program that time that I'm away and make sure that I'm not left to my own devices because if I am, I'll drift back to work. It's familiar. It's where I, I know what the rewards are. I feel comfortable. And sometimes when we're, we're doing nothing or doing something that's not work, we feel uncomfortable. So to give you an example, so we went to two of the weeks this, this past summer in July, uh, we went to Wyoming. So I made sure that every other day we had a fly fishing guide and Gail and I were out on the Snake River or the South Fork River in Idaho and we were fly fishing. So my days were filled with that. I've, I really am active in pursuing hobbies. So I'm learning to play the Native American flute. I've got a flute instructor. Wow. I went shopping for flutes while I was in Wyoming. I spent those other days doing that. And I've had various hobbies but I think you've got to have, you know, a really um, intentional, avocational life if you're going to ho have a hope of having a balanced life. And we, we plug the, the weekends with, you know, time with friends, time with our grandkids, time with each other. So the, the weekends are busy, but they're busy in rejuvenating kind of ways. Yeah. That, that's really exciting because I just, I just bought a Native American flute as well. So that's oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. And well, it's actually like really easy to start playing and sound like beautiful you know like you just learn it is else and you're you're off the races so that's really cool um okay no I, I i totally get that um okay so just going back to the quadrants for a moment um the goal is to get us where 90 percent or more of our time and our energy or work is spent in that desire zone and you talk about how that's that's where you're at today i would love if you could share uh and you said like there's only about three things three main uh yeah activities can you share those with us yeah so anything related to kind of finding the future, vision casting, that's number one. So I just have ability, if we look at strength finders, you know, one of my top five is futuristic. And so the ability to kind of step into the future, describe what I see, write it down and create a compelling vision for the team. 
And that's really important as it turns out, the bigger your organization is, we've got uh, 40 full-time employees now and trying to keep those all aligned. It begins with having a clear vision of the future so that everybody's aligning their goals with that vision of the future. So I spend a lot of time there. Uh, the second thing is creating content. So I have the luxury today of having six people on my content team. So thank God it's not just me, but it starts with me. So I'm writing every single day. You know, I, I feel like it's my job to kind of stock the pantry and then they can take the content that, that I create and expand it. And this is what's beautiful about having a content team. They can go add the research. They can find the historical, you know, the case studies or historical examples, that type of thing. But creating the content is a huge part of, I do, of what I do. And then the third thing that I do is presenting content. So whether it's on a podcast interview like this or a webinar or a live presentation or live streaming, uh, that makes up a tremendous, probably 50% of my week typically. Mm, that's really great. And just to speak more about the first one you shared, which is vision and vision casting, that, that is something that I've seen is like, it's like the un, unsung hero of entrepreneurship. I feel like it's the most important thing that most struggling entrepreneurs don't think is relevant. They're like, well, let me make some money first or let me yeah. get a following first. And I'm wondering, can you make a compelling argument about, about the importance of vision, especially for someone that just heard what you said and they're like, well, it's just me right now. I don't even have a team. You know, why would yeah. I need a team? Well, I, I do think that it becomes increasingly important as you build a team. And probably at the beginning, everybody starts with a vision. You know, they got some ideal, some thing that they're trying to build. But then life gets very reactive and, and you get very caught up in the daily stuff. And so if you're not careful, you begin to drift. And it, it's kind of like years ago, Gail and I had been married about 10 years. We decided to go to Hawaii on a vacation. And we didn't have any money at the time, but we could snorkel for free because the hotel had equipment that we could borrow. We went out into the lagoon. And so the first day after our lessons, we went out into the lagoon, got totally captivated by what we were seeing underwater. And next thing we knew, we'd been swept out in a riptide really far out to sea. So that when we looked up, we had a boogie board, thank God, we looked up and we were far from the shore. And we swam like crazy to get back into the shore. And we didn't go snorkeling for another 20 years. But the point is, you typically won't drift to a destination you would have chosen. If you're not intentional, if you don't have clarity about the future, how do you evaluate opportunities? How do you, how do you, how do you evaluate you know, what you should be doing with your time and where your team ought to be spending their time? If you're constantly being driven by the opportunities, you're gonna drift off course. You're gonna get somewhere probably that you wouldn't have chosen. So I think that coming back to a vision is, is uh, critically important and it needs to be written. Um, my next book, my book, which is coming out in 2020, which is kind of funny, ironic in a way, is on vision. And it's uh, called the, the Vision Driven Leader. So it's already written, it's in the can, it's with the publisher, we're sending it out for endorsements now. But I talk in that book about how to create a vision script because I don't subscribe to the idea that your vision sh should be some like one-liner thing about the future. But I think your vision needs to be articulated around four specific areas. And it's, it's about what you want your team culture to be. You know, what are you, what are you creating for your team? That doesn't just happen by accident either. Uh, the second thing is, what's your vision for the product that you want to create? That might be a service, but a product. And then around your marketing, and then finally around your, you know, objective or financial results that you want to get. And for us at our company, every year our annual planning process also begins with a strategic planning process where we true up that uh, three to five year vision. I love that. I, and I do, I do. I really think it's, it's so critically important. So I love how you flush that out. Thank you. Sort of like one line altruistic statement of like, our vision is to change the world. Yeah, right. Which it's, it's easy to start there. I, I totally get that. Um, well, speaking of all these books, I would love to know a little bit more about your productivity process so that you have the ability to run a company the size you do, do the amount of things you do, and write as much as you do. How does that start to look like? Yeah, well, it's... You know, I, first of all, I, I have to know where I add value. And this is kind of another thing I talk about in the book. But I have this three by three strategy. So the idea is that, and, and this comes from my book, Your Best Year Ever, but the best goal achievement research says that you should have 
no more than seven to 10 annual goals. And then I would say no more than two to three goals per quarter. The reason for that is because all of us operate within the context of a whirlwind of activity. And that takes a lot of our resources, a lot of our energy, a lot of our tension just to maintain and manage that. So a new goal by, uh, by definition is something that's outside of the whirlwind. It's a new initiative. So we have to be careful. The number one reason in my research and my experience with my clients, the number one reason people don't achieve their goals uh, is they lose visibility on the goal. But the number two reason is they're trying to do too many goals. They just have too many goals. So limited to three to two goals. So I start there. Then every week, I'm going to have three outcomes. What are the biggest three things I can deliver this week? And they need to be tied either to a goal, one of my quarterly goals, or they need to be tied to an important project. And in my planner system, in the Full Focus Planner, we have places for you to put this. Then it all comes down where the rubber meets the road, James. And I, this, this is like, what I'm about to share is deceptively simple. And yet my clients consistently report that this gives them such a quick win and a sense of forward momentum that they can't believe it. And that is to boil it all down so you have a daily big three. What are your three most important tasks for the day? And the, the thing about it is, is I think most people start the day feeling overwhelmed. You know, the research we did, we found that our average client or customer has 15 tasks on their daily to-do list. And they wake up in the morning feeling overwhelmed. They know there's no way they're going to accomplish all that. And even if they accomplish seven or eight of those, there's still seven or eight that are undone. So they go to bed at the end of the night feeling totally defeated. This is not a psychological state you want to live in, right? Where you're overwhelmed and defeated. So we got to reinvent the game. And so if you take the Pareto principle, that 20% of the effort drives 80% of the results, 20% of 15, magically three. So if you pick three and only three tasks that are your big three, you can have your other tasks, We've got a place in the planner to list those, but they don't rise to the level of those top three, the, the ones that are going to be related to a goal or one of your most important projects and really drive the results in your business. If you do that day in, day out, you begin to build confidence, you build a sense of momentum, and you really will start to, to uh, deliver the kinds of results that'll make you proud. And so when you're in writing mode, I assume, is it just a do you block off a certain amount of time per day when it's, you know, <clears throat> that's one of your daily three, or is it a certain amount of words? Like how do you measure that so that you know when to check that off the list? Yeah. Um, so what I do, one of the things I do talk about in the book, Free to Focus, is the importance of daily rituals. So I've tried this in the past where I've had a big, I would call it an achievement goal. Like I'm going to finish this 50,000 word manuscript by November the 30th. So that'd be an achievement goal. I found that a habit goal actually works better for me. And so what I do now, excuse me, is I write for one hour a day. And so uh, my goal in that one hour is to deliver at least 500 words, which is frankly pretty is easy, but that's, you know, basically 10,000 words a month. So like in five months, I could write a 50,000 word book by doing that. That's how I can, you know, turn out a book a year. But the thing that has made it work for me, and I just recently changed this, is I've added it to my morning ritual. So the stuff that's really important and the stuff like, like exercise, for example, if I wait till later in the day, pretty good chance that I'm going to blow it off. You know, something's going to happen. Something's going to interrupt me. Somebody's going to pull me off course and I'll get to the end of the day and go, oh, forgot the exercise. So I put that in. I get up at 430 in the morning. And so one of the first things I do is exercise. One of the things in that morning routine, though, even before I go to the gym, is I write. So I'm going to get my one hour put in and just little by little, you know, I'm generating this content, filling the pantry. So I like to say. I, I love that. And so uh, I also love the distinction of going from like that 15 items on the daily to do list down to three, which is really about um, saying no, right? Saying yes. No, but also a big part you talk about, which is something that's also very near and dear to me um, is delegation. And I'm yes. Like, I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about that, because that's something that's, um, you know, been really uh, impactful for me. But the big objection that comes up right away is people that are overworked and super busy and have a million things on their to-do list is saying, I'm not there yet. You know, I can't afford to even hire somebody to start delegating. Yeah. 
I'm wondering if you can kind of speak to that a little bit. I can. I, you know, I've, I've found over the years that entrepreneurs in particular have about three objections to delegation. The first one is that they say, you know, if I want it done right, I've got to do it myself, right? right? The second one is they say it takes longer to explain how to do it. I might as well do it myself. And I can't afford to pay somebody else right now, so I guess I'm going to have to do it myself. As long as the answer to each one of those statements is myself, your business cannot scale. That's simple. So the secret to scaling is delegation and bringing on uh, team members. In fact, I would say if your dream doesn't require a team, your dream's too small. Wow. So you got to be able to bring on a team. So let's talk about the one you raised, which is that last one, if I can't afford it right now. Yeah. So I had a guy in one of the masterminds I was leading years ago. In fact, Stu was in that same mastermind. And so we had a guy, we were both in the same one together. And this guy said, um, you know, I, I really am thinking I might need to hire a web developer, kind of like I was talking to you about earlier um, as we were talking. And he said, but I really can't afford it to do one right now. And so I just asked him the question. I said, how much are you paying? How much do you earn an hour? What's your rate when you can bill out? And he said, uh, about $150 an hour. And I said, so would you pay a mediocre WordPress developer $150 an hour? And he said, heck no. I said, well, you're already doing it, dude. And so it was like the light bulb went off. And he realized that he couldn't afford not to hire somebody. Now, the great thing about like an assistant, like that's the first hire you should make. You should get an assistant to take over those drudgery zone activities. And you should make sure that what's in your drudgery zone is in your prospective assistant's desire zone. So you hire an assistant, get rid of the drudgery zone because that's the stuff that's draining you. That's the stuff where it takes you twice as long as it would take somebody else to do it. So get rid of that stuff first. But here's how I started with a virtual assistant and I hired her for five hours a week because that's all I thought I could afford. And I said, I think I'm going to do it as a test. And so I did it for five hours a week. And I did that for two weeks. And it was like, whoa, I can't believe what I can get done in, those, in, the, in the time that, that, you know, the stuff that she's taken off my plate. So then I increased it to 10 hours a week, then to 20 hours a week. And then, you know, within several months, it was full time. Well, so you can start small. Well, I, I think one of the reasons as well as why that's so important is you talk about how, you know, these are things that we kind of know, but don't really realize is that time is fixed, but your energy can flex. Yes. And there's, okay, there's so many hours in a day and it's like, let me just do this myself because I have the time and I'll make the time. But when that is something that's in your drudgery zone, like that's just going to zap your energy. When you're doing that thing, you, that's right. you won't have that energy left to do the things that you actually need to be doing. So I, I just think this is just, it's so critically important. Well, that's the secret to productivity. It's not so much about time management, but it's about energy management. And that's why all these rejuvenation things are so important. I mean, literally, if somebody said to me, what's the single most important thing I can do to be more productive and more focused? I mean, to me, that's an easy answer. Get a great night's sleep. Yeah. You're never more productive, more focused than when you're well rested. And so your sleep has got to be uh, a priority if you're serious about winning at work and succeeding at life, being more productive and being uh, more focused. Second thing, I would say your nutrition and exercising. I, I talk about all that in chapter three of Free to Focus, but how we sort of maintain this instrument that is us, that we've been given is critically important to what we're able to produce in the world. Now, big picture concepts, totally get that. People love little hacks and tips and, and tricks. Do you have any for either increasing um, your quality and effectiveness of sleep or better health and nutrition that are like things people can go and do right now? Yeah. One of the, one of the things I really believe in is that coaching helps you go further, faster. And so I've had uh, a coach since the year 2000. I run a coaching program, but I also employ a lot of specialty coaches. So Several years ago, um, I've been a runner for about 15 years now, but I wasn't doing any strength training until about eight years ago. And I really struggled with it. I knew I needed it, especially as I grow older. And I was talking to a friend of mine at a conference and he said, why don't you just hire a trainer? And I was like, duh, that makes total sense. And so for me hiring a trainer, and by the way, I have a trainer that does it virtually and through an app and it costs me $100 a month. 
Wow. Wait, what's, what's the app? Can you share the app? Yeah, the app's called Trainerize, but you have to be a trainer to use it. But I'll, I'll tell you her website. I, I mean, this may flutter, you know, but uh, she's got a website called More Than a Body, morethanabody.com. Her name is Lisa His, Hiscock, H-I-S-S-C-O-C-K. You can link to it. But she's phenomenal. I've used her for two years. I got more results from her. I used, uh, I've used two other strength coaches in the past that actually worked out with me at the gym. I got more results from her and far cheaper. But in addition to that, like I have a nutrition coach. So I get a full panel of my blood taken uh, every six months. And so then we review, you know, everything. What are my vitamins? What are my minerals? My hormones? All that kind of stuff. And we tweak the supplements because it's all about energy management. That's amazing. I, I love that. And it is, it is uh, so important. So it, it, this is also uh, why I love the, the book. You know, I'm sure you know this, but there's over 4,000 books on Amazon in the like productivity and time management. Like, I didn't know that number. That's astonishing. It's, it's pretty astonishing. And to have such a counterintuitive approach, uh, which I firmly believe in is like doing less is, is the secret to a, a, achieving more because if you're not, if you're not taking this time to rejuvenate, to rest and recharge, then, you know, burnout is inevitable. So, um, yep. I, I, and I didn't get that when I started business. I didn't, me neither. You know, you're, I was young, you know, and so you're young, you think you're like superhuman and invincible and live forever, but like, you're not paying attention to sleep and what you eat and, you know, overall health and nutrition. So, so true. So, so critically important. Okay. I want to talk about like one, uh, one last thing before we, um, start to wrap it up here. Okay. And, and that's really something that becomes like anybody who's still here and, and on board and listening to this, this message and agreeing with it, is going to have to make some hard decisions. And some of those challenging, uncomfortable decisions involve a no. And that's something that I had to learn how to get, get good at. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak to, to that a little bit and give some tips and advice for somebody that's probably got so much on their plate because they're having a hard time saying no. And what, what would you say to them? I would say, first of all, you got to shift your mindset that uh, you're making a trade-off every time you say yes. This is a zero-sum game because time is fixed. So every time you say yes, you're implicitly saying no to something else. Every time you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. So for example, James, if you flew into Nashville and said, hey, Michael, can we have uh, coffee together or have breakfast together? Then I would automatically say no to you. And the reason I would say no is because I'm saying yes to my workout and I'm saying yes to my health and I'm saying yes to my family to be around as long as I can be to be able to support them and encourage them. So uh, in that no is a yes. And the easiest way to say no is to remind yourself of what you're saying yes to. So that's, that's one huge, huge key. Now, I'm not going to be a jerk about it. You know, if you were flying into town, I'd say, hey, the morning doesn't work for me, but could we get together for lunch? So it's not like I'm just going to, going to say no. But at some point, I'm tapped out. And I can't say yes to other stuff. And I need to know that I'm finite. You know, and I, th I think it's important to remember that. I'm not Superman. And I don't want to deceive myself into thinking that this situation is just temporary. Because the temporary can become very permanent. So we can say, well, you know, I'm, I'm willing to compromise my margin for right now because, you know, I'm trying to get this new product launched or I'm trying to get my new CFO acclimated or whatever it is. Those situations just kind of all bleed together and you end up developing a permanent lifestyle with that if you're not careful. I just so, want to uh, emphasize what you just said that the temporary can become permanent is I think so many of us are living into that illusion. Well, it's not always going to be like this. It'll get, it'll get right. Permanent. And I've definitely found myself there. It's like, it, this is just the season that we're, that we're oh, in. I've lied to myself. I've lied to my wife, you know, and I've had to finally, you know, get sober and come to the terms with, no, you're just a, you know, a people pleaser and you need to recover. So the other thing I would say, and this is a real practical hack, and I do talk about this in the book because the book's full of practical, simple strategies. But I get this yes, no, yes formula for saying no to somebody so that you can say no with grace and not trash your most important relationships. So I used to get these uh, requests all the time from people. And because I used to be in book publishing world, people occasionally even now ask me, could you review my book proposal for me? 
And so there's no way I have time to do that. You know, that's probably an hour investment for me to do that. There's just no way I have to do that unless, you know, you're my best friend. So uh, if somebody sends me that request, I first want to, first of all, want to start with a yes. And that is an affirmation of the request. So I don't want to just say, no, don't you know, I'm busy. You know, none of us would do that. We probably just wouldn't respond at all, but we just let it languish in our inbox. But instead I say, hey, congratulations. You've done what few aspiring authors do. You've completed a book proposal. Way to go. So that's a yes. So I've affirmed them. I've affirmed the request. Now I want to get to a clear and unequivocal no. The last thing I want to do is say, hey, you know, it's a busy season. Could you check back with me next month? Because guess what? That just boomerangs it right back on your to-do list. So instead, I want to say something like this, and, the, and there's, there's magic in the sequence of words I'm going to give to you. So what I want to say is, in order to honor my existing commitments, I'm afraid I'll have to say no. Now, what I've said there is that, first of all, I have a lot of commitments, but I haven't said, hey, I'm so busy, or I'm so important. No, I have other commitments I've made. I want to be a person of integrity. I want to honor those commitments. But in order to do that, I can't say just keep saying yes. So in order to honor um, my commitments, I'm afraid I'm going to have to say no. So that's clear, unequivocal, just, you know, that's it. Then I want to get to a yes. I want to end with something positive. It might just be, hey, I'm, I'm really honored that you ask. I wish I could help you, but best of luck. Or it might be if you can be helpful, you know, to say, but I've actually written a blog post that I think might be helpful. Or here's another friend that actually does this professionally and, you know, give them a link. And one of the things I've tried to do on this, James, is I've tried to create a bank of email templates so that with the most common requests that I get for my time, I've, I've learned to say no using that yes, no, yes formula for all those occasions. And somebody asked me to serve on their board, make a charitable contribution, you know, have coffee to pick my brain, review a book proposal, whatever it is, I've got a way to respond that's that yes, no, yes formula. And I literally don't have to think about it. That's so beautiful. And it's so simple. And I, I know that's going to help a lot of our listeners. So thank you. And I did want to circle back to how we started this podcast, which me referencing, uh, diving in a little bit to uh, my request to have you share and you saying yes. And I have to assume that part of the decision making process of saying yes, is that being on this podcast is within your top three activities that keep you in your desire zone of you presenting your content. Is that accurate? Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, you know, I, I put a lot of effort into this book. I really want to promote it. I want to get it out to as many people as possible. Um, I, I know you from Stu and a lot of other people, Amy, Claire, Amy uh, Porterfield, a lot of other people. And I just thought, you know, I, I would love to be on this podcast. So it was a perfect fit. Well, I'm glad you said yes. Very grateful. And uh, I love everything you've shared. Let's talk a little bit about the book because I'm a huge fan. Obviously, with the tagline, a total productivity system to achieving more by doing less. I'm always a fan of that. Um, so uh, I know you've got a really special offer and I'm going to add to the special offer for anybody who um, grabs the book. And let's not use this as an excuse. Michael, James, I just don't have time to read it because <laughs> that's the reason to read it. Um, can we talk absolutely. about that? Yeah, absolutely. So if people buy the book and they can buy it where better books are sold, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere they can find it, and then take the receipt and go to freetofocusbook.com, freetofocusbook.com. If you buy one to nine copies, we've got $354 worth of free bonuses. So we've got a four-part video series called Your Productivity Secret Weapon. And it basically is designed to help you hire, train, and leverage a world-class executive assistant. And this is something I did with my former executive assistant, who's now our director of operations. And We've had people tell us that, that it's just an amazing series. You know, it's helped them, given them information that nobody ever told them about how to work with an executive assistant. You'll also get a $10 gift card to the Full Focus store, which is where I sell my Full Focus planner, Full Focus journal, Full Focus notebook, and then a series of over 50 email uh, templates, which uh, you can just use and adopt, but it'll get you started and will save you hours every week in processing email. So all you got to do is submit your receipt, buy it wherever you want, submit your receipt, and you'll automatically get access to that stuff. Awesome. And even if you just get a minimum of one copy of Free to Focus and you forward that receipt to us, uh, customer success at jameswilmer.com, 
I am also going to be gifting you something. And this is my uh, mini course on how to hire and train your first virtual overseas assistant. Um, that's how I got started. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. Oh, absolutely. That's my treat. And it's something that I'm, I'm always so passionate myself. It's like, even when I was broke and living in my parents' basement, I knew back then that I couldn't do this all myself. <laughs> I started the same thing with five hours a week of uh, delegation and outsourcing. That's Perfect. So um, that is yours as well. Uh, when you pick up the book and make the time to read it. Because if you don't have the time to read it, that's the reason why you need to grab this book. That's the symptom. And I feel like so many of us, and I know you speak to this in the book, are using the symptom as the reason not to address the cause. And that's right. This book really taps into what-, what Thank you. Is. So um, any uh, parting final words, thoughts to share with our listeners before we call this episode complete? Yeah, I mean, it's almost cliche, but I would just say, if not now, when? You know, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling stuck, if you find yourself dreading Mondays, if you find yourself completely out of whack in terms of uh, work-life balance and you're ready for a change, this book is for you. And, you know, it doesn't cost that much. You can get started. You can make the time. And I mean, if you, if you look at Amazon, you know, it's five stars out of five which I've never had a book that had that, that higher rating. And that's after hundreds of reviews. And I think it's because people are getting the results they want to get. So. That's awesome. Uh, Michael, thank you so much again uh, for coming on. And uh, thank you so much to our listeners. We're going to link up uh, everything, all the links that we mentioned, including um, how you can uh, connect with Michael on social media, his website, and even his podcast lead to win, right? Which would be a great. That's great it. Thing. Yep. Um, to send our listeners as well. So uh, thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate it. Thanks, James. Honored to be on.